right. Cool, it's live. We'll let people pile in. Welcome everyone, welcome. All right. Oh yeah, wow, you can see the participant numbers like yeah. jumping up. I know, it like doesn't focus. let everyone join at once. It's just like, all right, we'll slowly <laughs> let people in, meter them in. All right. Grab one real quick. Yeah, go for it. Cool. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I am Liz with the Mountain Shop. I think we're just about got everyone joined. Uh, all right. Cool. Looks like the numbers are kind of steadying out. So, welcome, everyone. I'm Liz with the Mountain Shop. Thanks, everyone, for joining our Be Prepared to Repair in the Backcountry webinar. Tonight we're joined by John Barkhausen with Calf Adventures. He is a guide with them, area instructor. Um, he is the Portland Programs Director and the regional or the Olive Calf Operations Manager. Correct? Did I yeah. nail that? Cool. Nailed it. Sweet. Done. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to John and we'll talk about some of those repairs we might run into in the backcountry. Take it away, John. Sweet, awesome, thank you, Liz. Um, welcome everybody. Um, so yeah, like Liz said, my name is John Barkhausen. Um, I work for Cough Adventures uh, and I've been guiding and teaching um, various activities in the outdoors for about 15 years. I've been teaching skiing and avalanche classes for maybe eight years, nine years, something like that. Um, and so tonight my goal is to talk about some basic repairs you might do in the field. Um, and so that's gonna include talking about tools and equipment you might bring with you, um, sort of improvised implements you can use, like things that you don't have to bring a tool for. Um, and most of this stuff is talking about sort of the small scale breaks and bends and things. And then we'll talk a little bit about sort of the major stuff that can happen um, and ways to fix it. Um, because these things can, that can go wrong, they can be tiny and minuscule and just kind of be a pain to deal with the rest of the day, but they could get all the way up to the point where it's going to be a huge effort to get you back to the car or get you out of the backcountry or, um, whatever it is. So we're going to talk about some ways to mitigate all that. Um, the way it's going to flow is I'm going to bust out my, my repair kit that I carry with me every day in the backcountry. Um, and we're going to go over gear. Uh, we'll even get some ideas from you all about gear you might carry with you, and I'll try to answer some questions there. Um, then we're going to talk about some common things that go wrong and what to do if they do go wrong. Um, and then from there, we are going to just take some questions. That'll kind of be the flow. So here we go. This is my repair kit. Um, it's pretty small, but it's kind of heavy, and it's got a lot of noisy bits in it. Um, it's basically the same kit that I carry all year round, even like when I'm alpine guiding and um, climbing guiding, I just swap out gear. So there's some things that are really universal and some things that are very specific to skiing. Um, I'm gonna tilt this down a little bit to show the stuff more. Okay, so let's pull this stuff out. So the first is ski straps. So ski straps can be super useful I usually have like eight or 10 on me at any one time. There are various sizes. This is a nice sort of skinny one for just gear and stuff. This one's broken, um, but still totally useful. And then I even have a bunch more that I actually wrap up in rubber band. Um, so they take up less space and aren't in the way when I'm trying to get at something else. Um, I also usually have one of these just tucked into the brain of my pack, um, mostly for if I'm going to carry skis in an A-frame on my backpack. And occasionally I'll do like repairs. The other place people commonly carry these is on their ski pole, which totally works as well. So there's those. Try to make them nice and convenient here. Um, next thing here is a pole basket. This is probably the, the repair kit piece that I use the most. I just buy like three or four at a time. Um, 
this is a black diamond basket, but uh, it fits most um, types of poles. Not having a basket on a pottery day can super ruin your day. It'll like send you back to the car. So this basket. Um, this also in the, in the pole world is a pole splint. So if you break your pole, so I'll show you how to use that later. Let's see, we have some various bits of cordage. So this is just like parachute cord, little thin cord. Um, I like to have like two or three shorter sections as opposed to one long section. It becomes a little bit more versatile. Um, it's nice to have for like a whole variety of reasons. Um, I have my headlamp just in case, you know, it gets dark. I keep my headlamp without batteries in it because this is my spare. Um, and if I keep it with batteries in it, it's likely to um, turn on when I don't want it to turn on. So uh, let's see, I have, this is some bailing wire. Um, it's just like a thin gauge metal wire. It should be like just thin enough where you can kind of manipulate it with just your hands. And then I also have a tool that I can cut it with. Um, and bend it with uh, if I have to. So bailing wire can be super useful because it's it's a little bit more rigid, obviously, than the cord. Um, and it's also a little bit more lower profile. And so if you have to do something with the rigidity, you can do something that's like repeatable. Like if a buckle falls off and you need to just be able to strap a boot closed and take it off and then put it back on and then take it off, you can make a little like sort of circular clasp with the wire and it'll stay in place even if you have to pull the strap out, put it back on, pull the strap out, put it back on. One trick that I do with this, let's see if I can show it on the camera, is I bend back the tips so that the wire doesn't poke a hole um, in my little stuff sack here for my backpack. This is a little pro tip for you, bend those back. And that's on both sides. Um, and I've had this wire for years and years and years, and I've used it a few times, and then I just wrap it back up and I'll use it again. Um, the tool that I have uh, is also really nice because it has, a, you know, it's a multi-tool, so it's got all kinds of options. One thing that's important is some kind of like screwdriver is nice. Um, can opener is usually classic, although I've never used it. Uh, and then a knife, obviously, is also super useful um, for a whole variety of things. Okay, what else have we got in here? I have a little bivy sack. So this is a little like mylar bivy sack. I'm not going to unroll it because they're basically one time use in terms of getting them back into the bag. But they're the little foil SOL bivy sacks. So these are nice for emergencies. You've got to stay warm and get somebody warm. They can also be useful if you're, if you're making some kind of improvised sled. Um, I have spare batteries. And what I do is both my Avalanche transceiver and my headlamp take three AAA batteries. So I go ahead and I tape um, my batteries into packs of three because that's what all my stuff uses. Um, and that way I know that if I pull a pack of three out of my repair kit, they're good batteries. And then if I am taking old batteries like out of something like my headlamp and I just throw them in the bag so I can like get rid of them and stash them, then I know that loose batteries uh, are not good. So good batteries taped together. It's kind of a trick I picked up a bunch of years ago. Uh, lighter can be important. I just like the little mini ones. Good for like sealing the ends of ropes and things and also starting fires if you're cold. Um, this is a super useful tool that comes in handy a lot, um, especially if you ride with snowboarders. Um, it's just a little ratchet tool. Um, and then it's important to have bits that work with your various pieces of gear. So I have a variety of bits here. Um, Flathead, Phillips head, things like that. They just go in the go in the head of the device, and then you go. Um, I think this is a Dekine tool. 
don't know if anybody knows what symbol that company is, but um, it's pretty useful. Um, I like how small it is. It's, it's heavy, but it's small. Um, Black Diamond also makes one that's like a T-shape. Um, it's a really good little ratchet. Um, I've also seen people use like small, like ratchet style socket head wrenches with, with this sized um, head. It can also be useful. And then the last thing that I have um, is this little kit. And this is a whole bunch of little items um, that I'm gonna open up and show off. These are probably a little bit beyond the like basic recreationalist um, and more into the guiding, like long, um, maybe multi-day trip kind of situation because hopefully I wouldn't be opening this box unless like it's really hitting the fan. Um, but I will open it up and try to show things off. So the first thing I have here, this is a little Allen key. So the bolts on my, on my bindings uh, are different than your standard mounting screw. And this is the Allen key to tighten them. So I make sure I always have that. I have four bolts with wing nuts and washers. I just don't keep the washers on there. And this is actually to make a little improvised sled out of a pair of skis. Um, then I also have a drill bit that is big enough for those bolts to go through. So this has the little hex quick connect bottom. And so it actually fits into this ratchet. So I can use this um, to drill a hole in a thing. And uh, I will show you what I might use that for later. Um, I also have a little drill bit that's big enough for cord to fit through or bailing wire um, and can also be nice to start this hole um, because drilling through skis and metal sheets and stuff you might want to start with a smaller hole. Uh, and then my last few bits besides the washers is I have a, like eight or so of these screws. So these can be useful if you have to attach something to a ski um, or you know, potentially reattach a binding or something like that with those. So that's my little super emergency kit. Um, again, it's heavy, but if I was in a situation where I absolutely needed this stuff, then I would be happy to have it. Um, in terms of repair kit items, that's pretty much everything that I bring. And so then I was curious if anybody else has um, any other items that they gen generally carry with them, um, go ahead and throw them up in the chat. And throughout the rest of the talk, we will talk about those items and um, I'll be like, oh, that's an awesome idea. Um, oh, duct tape, of course, duct tape. So here's my duct tape. Um, I just have it wrapped around my ski pole. Um, and someone also mentioned electrical tape. Electrical tape can be super useful as well. Um, electrical tape, you can like stretch it and like wrap it around something multiple times and it holds super well. Um, and, uh, but it can also uh, be more brittle in the cold electrical tape. Um, let me open up this chat here. Duct tape, yeah, super glue can also be really good. Um, that's just a quick little fix. It's not always the strongest. So if it's a high stress area, it might not work super well. Um, yeah, skin wax can be great on a hot day if you're getting some, some snow clumpage on the bottom of your skin. Um, let's see what else we got. Thread and needle, alcohol for cuts, cash. Cash is probably a pretty good idea. Yeah, I think alcohol for cuts and any kind of first aid stuff, I wasn't planning on going into, but yeah, full first aid kit I bring all the time. Um, epoxy, yeah, epoxy can be super useful. Um, one thing that I learned recently is that the faster the set of epoxy, so you can get like five minute epoxy, 10 minute epoxy, 30 minute epoxy. So the faster the set, the more brittle the resulting um, epoxy sort of set resin is. So keep that in mind um, when you're getting epoxy. Um, like if you're doing a repair at home, it might be nice to have like a 30 minute or a 60 minute epoxy. But for the field, you might wanna have a, like a five minute. 
Um, extra skin tails can be super useful for sure. So if you have one style of skin tail, it can be nice to have those. Even like a whole like rubber tail that can fit into your skin. That can be nice. Um, what else we got here? Rubber bands, rubber bands could be good. Um, they're sort of quick and easy things to hold things together. Um, aspirin again is then sort of the first aid situation. Sewing kit um, could be useful. I might take that on like an, on an expedition um, for like a multi-day trip uh, or even just some patches if you like end up burning a hole in a jacket or something like that. Um, we got some fire starter things. Cordelette, cordelette's good for like hauling people out of the back country. Um, let's see, favorite kind of duct tape. Um, I don't think I do have a favorite kind of duct tape. I think not the cheapest stuff at the hardware store. I think I've definitely been hosed by buying the cheapest roll at the hardware store. Um, and so getting something like a little bit nicer than the cheapest stuff. The black Gorilla Tape um, can be really good. It's like nice and thick. Um, so that can be pretty good. Um, zip ties, yeah, zip ties can also be super useful um, for sure. Um, I'm just gonna scroll through these. Metal shavings and epoxy, uh, pulling out of a screw. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we get to screws or um, dealing with screws getting pulled out of skis. Um, that can be a super useful tip. Um, great, so people should feel free to scroll through all this stuff. Um, Um, and just read some items and get some more ideas for things to throw in their kits. Um, basically what I found is that this kit works really well for me and all of the things that I've ever had to deal with, I've been able to deal with stuff that's basically like this. And so this is what I've whittled my kit down to, but I think that everybody has different experience and different sort of personal preferences. And so we'll likely end up bringing their own kind of personal stuff um, on their own kit. I'm just going to jump on real quick. So you guys can't see each other's chat, only the panelists can see it, but I will put together a list um, and send it out to everyone who's registered. So I'll include that with like the follow-up video um, link, including all of John's as well. So just so everyone knows. <laughs> Sweet. I did not know that. I was Zoom illiterate in that regard. <laughs> totally fine. That's so awesome. No worries. Yeah, I'll get it out to everyone. Don't worry. All right. Cool. Continue. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Liz. Okay, so now um, from there, we're going to go ahead and jump right into some of the things that can happen. Um, and they're going to start with sort of the least um, extreme and go to the more extreme events. So I'm going to push my repair stuff kind of out of the way. I'm going to go a little more up here. Okay, so we're gonna start with um, some pole repairs. So I had a few items that were specific to ski poles. Um, so the first one is a basket losing. I'm not gonna pull this basket off and put a new one on, um, but they're pretty straightforward pretty much every time. Um, the, the black diamond ones kind of screw off and then you just screw them back on. Um, sometimes I'll find if it's an off brand basket. So if I had like G3 poles and a BD basket, I might have to throw duct tape on underneath it. So I might rip a piece of duct tape to like a really skinny strip and then build it up around the bottom so I could keep it on there. Um, I had a guy lose a basket like 20 minutes into a day and then he tried to go on without the basket for like another 20 minutes and he like said he was going home. He was like, I can't do it. Like you just immediately lose everything. So bas having a basket can like, it's like such a light item to save the day. It's huge. Um, so that's the basket. So now, but what happens if you break, break your pole? I've also had this happen. Um, so this is a pole splint. This is a, an old soup can or can of tomatoes or something. Um, I cut it down the side and I have probably about two thirds of the can. I don't have all of it. Um, this is a beefier splint than you might need. Uh, you could probably go with half a can. 
Um, I like the soup cans instead of beer cans or soda cans, just because they're a little bit beefier um, and they're just a little bit stronger in terms of um, holding weight. So besides the can, I have three pipe clamps on here. So um, a pipe clamp is just like this little piece of metal on one side that controls how tight the strap gets. So I keep them pretty tight. And then I have my little ratchet here. Um, and you can just then loosen them up. And take these off of here. You can actually also take these like all the way apart um, and actually pull the strap out of the little gear thingy. But you can see as you screw it, it gets bigger and bigger. Um, if you didn't have a pole that could separate, I guess you have two pieces of pole anyway if your pole's broken. So that doesn't really matter. But you could, if you had to, for some reason, let's say you're fixing something besides a pole, um, you could pull them all the way out, just put it around an object you couldn't slip it over. Um, and then there you go. So then let's say this is a broken pole, so it's in two pieces, right? Then you take your, your sleeve, your splint, and you slide it over one section. You might have to make it a little bit bigger, in which case you have your pliers here. And then you want to cover, you want to get about half of it over the one pole. And then I have the third one to go right over the break and then for the middle one, and then you slide it over the other side. And then you have all three of your clamps here. And then you just tighten them down and that should get you out of the back entry. Um, another trick, if you're finding that your poles are extra slippery or this isn't holding, is you, you, slip, you slip the sleeve over the broken side, slide it well below the break, tape the two pieces of pole together with duct tape, like that, and then slide this back over the duct tape, because then when you clamp the can down, the duct tape gives it something to really grab against. And the duct tape holds it a little bit tighter and prevents it a little bit from pulling apart this way more. Um, the pull splints, again, not very heavy um, and can be super useful um, and essentially save a day of skiing. Like you could keep skiing at this point. Um, again, poles might not feel like that mandatory of an item, especially if you're a snowboarder. Um, but they can like make or break a day sometimes. So that's splinting a ski pole. All right, what's my next thing? Um, the other one I want to touch on briefly is that this is the black diamond sort of flick lock style um, adjustable ski pole. The other style, um, is like the spinny kind where you spin it one direction and it tightens and you spin it the other direction and it loosens and you need to pull them apart and you spin it. Um, I've every pair of those I've ever owned have failed at some point. Um, I actually don't think I've ever owned any, but every pair I've ever interacted with have failed at some point. And so it's nice to just be able to lock those in. And that would be either a ski strap uh, or duct tape, likely. Um, you just set it to the size you want, spin it and try to get um any kind of like tightness and then duct tape it um or you can use this the splint 
if you want. Um, but I think duct tape would fix that. Okay, moving on. Boot repairs. I need a pair of boots. So here's a ski boot. So you can imagine that um, a few things could go wrong with a ski boot um, in the backcountry. One, probably the most common one would be a broken buckle. And so this screw for mine, you know, might break or you might have a rivet that would shear off. Um, and so a couple options, um, you could carry in your little hardware kit, um, short little bolts and nuts. So you could actually sort of reattach that if you wanted to. Um, you could try to put one of those screws through there if you had to. Um, or if you were just doing one more down, you could actually just ski strap your whole boot shut. So if we were like in down mode and didn't want to keep going, and you know, you probably have other straps or other buckles that are going. So you might do your Velcro strap and then do a ski strap. So that would work. You need your extra long one. Just gotta get to that first bolt. So there you go. Probably not gonna ski as stiff as normal. That's probably the most basic um, repair there. The other one I might do would be a piece of cord. Um, so if you sheared off like this section of um, your buckle, you would have the hole that's right here. And if you didn't have a hole, you could drill a hole or you could unscrew the screw that's in there. Then you could feed cord through that hole and then tie what's called a trucker's hitch um, uh, and really tighten that down. So I'm trying to think of a good way. Here we go. So I have a hole right here. That's because I can adjust these binding, these boots. Let's try this out. I'm going to put this through here. I'm going to tie a loop here. Like that. And then you actually want to wrap the opposite direction. So back around this way. And then I might do a few wraps here, partially to just use up all this cord, partially to add a little bit more stiffness to this whole situation. And then when you had enough, when you had enough wraps around that, you could come back and a trucker's hitch this is a great thing to Google later because there's no way I'm going to get a good view of tying this. But so now I've been going towards this knot here. I'm going to bring this through this loop I tied. Like that. And pull this tight. And now the beauty of the trucker's hitch is you can really pull that tight. And then I could even wrap a couple more times. And then I could tie that off with a couple half hitches um, or something like that. So that would probably be my preferred method um, for replacing a broken buckle, especially if I was in like really high consequence terrain. Like if you had just sort of like shredded a quarter of some um, really steep couloir with high consequence and then you broke a buckle and you wanted to make sure you had some rigid boots then I'd really hoss down on that thing. So that would be how I would do a buckle. Um, the third option would be is something I don't carry with me, which is a very long pipe clamp. So it's, it's this same kind of clamp. 
Um, but some people carry like six or eight inch versions. Um, and so you could actually like open it all the way up, put it around your boot and then like really crank it down. That would be good like in expedition style because then it would probably be really solid and it wouldn't break and you could take it on and take it off many times really easily. Um, so if I was like going on an expedition, I might, I might do it that way. Um, sweet. So that's a broken buckle. Um, the other thing that can commonly break is this thing. I have no idea what this thing is called. So I'm just going to call it the axle. Um, it's basically like the hinge point of your boot. Um, it's like where your, this boot flexes forward and backward. And it, when this thing breaks and comes out, then it kind of makes your boot like unusable. It's like a huge pain. Um, so there's a few different ways that you can do that. One that you'll see a lot of guides do and various folks do is they'll carry like a little T-nut and a bolt. So a T-nut is essentially like a flat piece of metal with like a threaded nut right on the end of it. And then a bolt can screw right into that. And so what you do is you put the T-nut on the inside and then you, you screw the bolt down um, into that T-nut. So again, I might do that on like an expedition on like a multi-day trip, because if you break this on like day one and it's your only pair of boots, um, then you're pretty hosed. Um, another option again is the ski strap. And I'm actually gonna pull out my long ski strap. Um, and instead of just going up high, you just come down low here. I would lock my heel. And luckily your boots have all kinds of things that get in the way. So you can kind of like use the shape of the boot to hold ski straps in certain places. Um, and then you pull that nice and tight and that would be a, a pretty nice fix. It wouldn't be perfect, um, but it would give you the option to get out of the backcountry for sure. Um, the last one you could potentially do I don't think I've ever done in the field, but I was just thinking about it, is you could use billing wire um, and potentially run it through the hole and then create some loops. Um, and then if you had to prevent your, like the upper part of your shell from pulling out, you could actually take the cord and wrap it underneath your boot um, and like loop it through the billing wire and wrap it underneath your boot um, and pull that tight. So that could potentially hold the cuff of your boot downward. Um, so using billing wire to kind of like create a loop that sticks out of this hole. You'd have to get creative with what to attach that to on the inside. So that would get a little bit challenging. Yeah, that's it for boots. That's, those are the things that can go wrong with boots that are easily fixable. Um, yeah, cool. All right, now probably the meat and potatoes here um, is binding problems or ski problems. Um, so the biggest thing with bindings, the binding problem would be pulling the binding out of the ski, right? So you have screws that go down through your binding right here and into your ski um, and really hardcore skiers or really old skis or skis that weren't mounted properly um, could you could pull a piece out and commonly you'll see the heel piece pull out because um, people will like rock it into something and you'll put a lot of strain going forward and it'll pull your binding out um, so it's a huge problem because all of a sudden you don't have a way to attach your body to your ski um, which is kind of important if you're going skiing. Um, so there's a few options. The option that I opt for is that I actually don't have ski shops glue the mounting screws into my skis. I just have them drill the holes because I don't trust myself to drill those holes. And then I put in metal inserts into the skis. Uh, where's 
So this gives me two thing options. One, it means I can swap bindings from ski to ski. So that's what I do. I have one pair of bindings, two pairs of skis. Um, but then uh, it also allows me to easily replace bolts if I lose bolts. So those are epoxied in there. They're a little bit beefier than your than your standard positive drive screw. Um, and so it's very unlikely that they're pulling out. Uh, yes, they are quiver killers. I saw a chat pop up. Um, I don't remember if mine are binding freedom or quiver killers. I think they're quiver killers. Um, but they sell them. Uh, you can go to their website. They sell like tons and tons of inserts and then you buy the, the bolts by the, by the binding. And so they give you the right. Oh, and Mountain Shop sells them too. Rad. Um, so that's one option. Um, but obviously you, you can't do that in the field. That's not gonna be something you do in the field. Um, so what's another option? So one person mentioned epoxy. And so if you still have the screw um, or you carry spare binding screws, you can actually go to the same hole or you can use your fancy drill kit and clean the hole and drill out a new hole. Um, and I would keep the old hole. It's debatable, it depends on the break. Um, but you can dab some epoxy on the end of the screw there and into the hole, and then you can re-screw it. And one person recommended, which I think is totally great, is you have some metal shavings or some steel wool um, that you wrap around that old screw before you drive it into the hole, or you like stuff it into the hole before you drive that screw into the hole. Um, because when that screw pulls out of the ski, it's gonna pull material, you know, ski material out with it. And so you need to replace that material with something and just epoxy isn't gonna be strong enough to get you off the mountain. So you're gonna wanna put something to fill in there um, besides just that epoxy. Um, so that's gonna be a pretty important step. So that's option number two, if you have that gear um, and you're able to do it that way. Um, option number three, is you ignore the fact that your the heel of your binding is no longer attached to your ski and you just try your darndest to attach your boot to your ski the best that you can. Um, these bindings are currently set up for a different boot so they're not going to fit properly but um, let's say you have your boot like this actually I can put it in tour mode so that doesn't do anything. Um, so you have your boot on here and so you can take any kind of combination of things that you have um, to try to attach that boot down to your ski. And so one thing that you see frequently is those long pipe clamps, like I mentioned. So if you have like a six or eight inch pipe clamp, you can probably get it around the sort of like four ankle um, and down around your ski. And it's gonna go around all the way around the bottom of your ski. Um, you can also go and have that pipe clamp sit right back here and go around the bottom of your ski. You could try billing wire. And likely what I would do is I would do billing wire a couple times around um, the bottom of the ski. And then I would also include um, cordage around the bottom of my ski. Um, and that's how I would do it. The reason I would do it that way, and a lot of people are gonna be like, oh, what the heck, the skiing is gonna be horrendous. Um, well, you just pulled the back of your binding out of your ski. Um, your alternative is that the skiing just isn't anything, there's no skiing. Um, and so I think that the ability to just move down the mountain um, with the gear that I already have without carrying a tube of epoxy um, is fine in terms of the repairs that I would do. Um, or, or you telly, or you attempt to telly in Dina Fit bindings. Um, that's what I should carry. I should carry a little set of springs that I could just like screw in right here so I could telly. Um, or go back to telly skiing. That's another option. Um, option number four um, would be uh, a whole nother binding piece. So this is like definitely more expedition style. Um, and 
works really well if you have the inserts that I have um, and could work moderately well if you don't. Um, I think it's still doable. But if you have an extra toe and an extra heel, then um, if you pull one out or even break an element of the binding, um, so like let's say like my whole turning mechanism didn't work, but I had a spare heel, um, then I could just pull these bolts out and then drop in a, a new heel piece and I'd be good to go. So if I was on like a 20 day expedition, um, I would likely take uh, spare um, binding pieces with me. Heels, uh, just one heel and one toe. Um, and if you're going with like a big group um, and you, if you coordinate and it all works out for everybody's budget and you all have the same toes and heels, um, that can save a lot of weight for the group because you probably only need one toe or maybe two toes, two heels um, for the whole group. Um, I know a lot of guiding companies that do that. Like you have to use their skis um, because they all have the same bindings. And so then they can fix bindings really easily. Um, so yeah, those are probably the four most dominant options if you pull a heel piece or a toe piece out of your ski. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, another thing that can potentially break with your bindings is um, where the binding attachment actually breaks. And so I haven't seen it that much, but sometimes the pins on DinaFit bindings can, can pop out or tech bindings, I should say. So here are the pins. So I've seen these things shear, or like maybe one of these sides shears, especially um, for some of the other bindings that use like fewer metal components. I know a lot of them use all metal, but some don't. Um, you can also potentially lose these pins in the back. I've seen that happen or they, the spring in the middle or like the thing that pulls them together breaks. And so they don't have any force anymore to hold your boot to your binding. Um, so if that's the case, then you're kind of doing some of the same stuff, but you're just going straight to the binding. So you don't have to worry about going underneath the ski. So let's say my heel piece was broken um, in terms of like the attachment pins here. Um, I could just take a ski strap or something and try to go around the back of the binding heel piece like that. And I can attach it that way. Um, I can always double up ski straps. Um, like if one isn't long enough, you can just connect them together. If you do that, I would recommend duct taping like one of them like closed. And then you can come in Come sa, I'll go the right direction here, and then you could go that way. Wow, that's an official test. That's the din test. It's a din of two. Um, I see some questions coming in. I'm gonna try to get to the questions at the end. Um, the chat feature just shows me like the first two words. Um, and so I, I don't want to have it open because then I can't see stuff. So um, I'll get to all those in just a couple minutes. We're almost done here. Um, you could also do that same trucker's hitch option for that same thing. So let's say you had, again, really high consequence terrain. Um, you could, same idea with the trucker's hitch, have the loop be like up here and then wrap around and I would, again, I would say a bunch of times. You could even go to a couple different places on the binding. Um, and then you're just creating this like two to one advantage. And you could really crank that down and get a lot of force to hold your binding down. You could do the same thing with the toe. Um, and I would recommend like coming like back to the heel, like back here, um, especially if your heel connectors are still working. Sweet. So, um, yeah, that's kind of that. Um, 
Liz posted a picture of a broken ski, like a ski like totally flexed broken in the toe. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do with that. Um, but if you had like a long way to go, you could potentially um, find something else that was rigid, like maybe a stick or a log or something like that, um, and use the screws that are in your little hardware kit um, and actually screw a splint down to the top sheet of a ski. Um, my, or you could also just like take a stick or something rigid and like duct tape it or ski strap it. Um, create some kind of little splint for the tip of a ski. Um, and then maybe that would be just good enough to get you out. I would probably, if I was, if I was skiing like super deep, deep powder, then I might try to do this. Um, and I, I would try like really hard to make it nice because that float is going to save you a lot of time. If I was skiing like kind of like crud or chunder or something like that, I would probably wouldn't put a lot of effort into this because um, I could rely mostly on my other ski. So the thing you should really learn how to do is ski on one ski, at least a little bit. Um, and if you have to, just side slip with the full ski in the front and go left. If you're a split boarder and you break one of your split boards, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Maybe you can reconnect the board and just ride that edge the whole time. Is that a thing snowboarders can do? Um, I do apologize to split boarders that this is a ski centric um, webinar. I only ski, um, I don't have a split board. So I think the most common, uh, we can talk about split boards. Um, cool. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna go over um, is, uh, the very, very basics for building a sled out of your skis. I think this is an important skill to have and it, it comes back to my repair kit because I, I carry a lot of the stuff to build a little sled um, in my repair kit. I don't carry like an officially built, um, manufactured, like sold as rescue sled. Um, I think that they are awesome. Some don't need skis to function and some do. And I've heard that the ones that don't um, function quite a bit better than the ones that do. But if you don't carry any kind of sled situation, um, then you should know how to make a makeshift sled. Um, and the basics are you take the patient's skis. So remember, this is always going to be the patient's skis because you want to be able to stay on your skis. Um, or if it's a split board, you want to split the skis or the board because it, it needs to be a little bit wider than a snowboard is. Um, you're going to lay them out kind of flat. And the whole goal is to keep them rigid in this formation. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find a couple of sticks or maybe the victim's like shovel or the patient's shovel handle. And I'm going to drill, I'm going to whittle the stick flat with my Leatherman knife. I'm going to drill a hole in each end or if it's a shovel handle. You know, mine, mine would actually work pretty well because it has two pieces. Um, I would like drill a hole right where this hole is all the way through and I would do it on both sides. And then I would drill a hole in the tip of each ski. And then I would place this on the tip and then I would place another one on the tails. I'm not going to drill holes in my skis, so I'm not going to demonstrate that fully. Um, and then these bolts, I have wing nut, bolt, washer, washer. And then I can create a setup where these come through those holes, secure these four corners. So I'd get this corner and then I'd bolt this corner and then the, t the two tails. So now I've got myself a square and you can tighten them as much as you want. It's not gonna make it like that rigid. It's still gonna scooch forward and backward. So then you have to do something in the middle. 
And the most common thing to do in the middle is to take your shovel. This is kind of a reason that shovels have holes besides patrollers wearing them on their backs. Um, and you can place this in the middle. It's probably smart to do it like this way, actually. Um, and then you take cord and ski straps and essentially anything you can possibly do. And you attach, you tie knots, you tie this. You can pull them in towards each other as much as you want because these will hold them spread apart and that'll help create some tension to lock it in. So you can do that. The other thing you can do, I actually only have one pole inside right now, but um, you can take ski poles and you can go from the heel piece of one binding to the tip of the ski on the other side. You can lock your pole in place and then you can strap all this together and this can get strapped to that cross beam, right? And so that, and if you do it with two poles, that creates this nice X right there and it can make that pretty rigid. Um, then you can take a backpack, mostly empty backpack, and lay it on top and lay clothes and lay whatever else you have. Skins would work really well um, to make some kind of padding. And then you put a person on top of that and then you have a piece of cord or something like that and you can pull that little makeshift sled out. Um, it's not gonna be awesome to get somebody out, but it may be the difference between like waiting for PMR to come get you um, and being able to get yourself out. Like if someone like bust an ACL or something like that. So, um, or work. So if you're curious, you can look into, how does my shovel work? Um, you can look into the pre-made sleds also. Whew, that was a whirlwind. Um, so now we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, I'll talk quickly about split boarding. Um, split boards, I think the most common thing to happen is losing the screws, um, the binding screws. So for split boarders, 100%, I would recommend carrying extra screws um, and the Allen wrench or whatever that you need to make them tight. That's, that's the number one thing. And then I think a lot of the other stuff is pretty universal um, to bring. All right, Liz, you're welcome back now. <laughs> we can do questions. All right, cool. I think I kept track of all the ones that were in the Q&A and the chat, but if anyone has other questions, they can throw them in that Q&A function and Sweet. we'll try and get through them. So starting from the top, um, there was one question back when we were listing what was in our repair kit uh -huh. and how often do you replace the duct tape on your pole? Uh, I actually did this today. So it's been empty for like two years. Um, so I just did it today. You could probably go um, every other season or whatever. It does kind of get old and grimy. So you may want to, I usually just would throw new stuff on top of old stuff because I'm lazy. But um, yeah, this sure. is today. I would say a couple of years, three, four, five years. Okay. Um, do you know the weight of your repair kit for a day kit, day trip versus an expedition? Um, for a day trip, um, if I was going out by myself, it might be like a pound ish and I would slim some of this down. Um, but honestly, during guiding season, it's like probably two or three pounds. Um, and that's pretty much every day that I'm going out. Like even today, I just did a lap on above Palmer and, um, I had my full kit with me. So two, cool. three pounds, probably expedition would weight. be quite a bit bigger. Cause I'd have... yeah, exactly. Good training weight. So um expedition would be quite a bit heavier just because of like extra binding pieces maybe some of those bigger pipe plants stuff like that for sure but it can get kind of heavy it can get kind of heavy um do you have a trick for keeping your bindings from icing up between ski hiking and transitioning to skiing um i try to be careful um and then when that fails because it always does um my trick is I don't I don't prevent it from happening. I just know how to like deal with it when it does. 
And the thing that I do is I'll take the, the bottom side of my pole. And actually most binding work you do, you should do the, the handle of your pole because it's just a little bit more accurate and does a little bit less damage. Um, but I just do this. And I just work those springs over and over and over and over again. Um, just wake the baby. A rat up. in my garage. Oh. <laughs> no, it was a rat. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, like literally running around. He didn't like that binding noise. Um, <laughs> that'll bust some of that ice out of there. Um, okay. And then with heel pieces, with heel pieces, I'll just like jab it with the end of the pole. But that's that's usually what I do. But that like repeated motion, like over and over again, that works pretty well. Um, what did you use initially to cut the can for the pole? Uh, I used a pair of tin. I used a pair of tin snips. Um, you can also use like a really heavy duty pair of like kitchen shears if you're really right. careful. Um, but yeah, it can be tricky. Or you can use. I mean, the Leatherman will work. It'll just take you like two hours. Okay. But this little wire. That might get you through it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't totally everyone over to my house to cut cans with my tin snip. Next year. <laughs> They're always next year. Um, that's a good recommendation. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, where did you find the drill bit to fit that little ratchet? That's a really good question. So you can get on Amazon. Um, you can get, um, they're called, um, Oh man, I could look them up. They have a specific name a lot of times. You, you okay. want them made metal as well. Um, there's also a website called McMaster Car um, yeah. that's uh, you could buy individual um, like drill bits cool. for different sizes. But you can buy a set of like six on Amazon for like $3. Okay, cool. Um, and then yeah. have you ever tried to drill through a ski by hand? Have you ever tested I, I, a bit? I have not, um, but I have, when I was trained in some of this stuff, um, my instructor had done experiments and it takes a while. It takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, like my skis, these skis have a metal sheet in them. Um, so that's going to take some time, but um, it's definitely doable. It just might take a little bit of work. That's one reason that you have that skinnier bit so that you can do a pilot hole. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. We'll have to test it out at the shop with some like old skis, see how long it takes. Have like oh, a yeah. contest when COVID's over of like ski drilling by <laughs> hand. Oh my God, let me know. That'd be cool to do like a tech kit video. And, like, oh, look. for sure, for sure. Okay. Um, can you explain how to secure your boot to the ski if your toe piece breaks? What did you use for that? If you pull out the binding or just the toe piece breaks? I think if just like the toe piece shears off. Um, so there's a couple options. So let's say, um, let's say you don't have any toe piece, then it would be pretty similar to if you lose your heel piece. So you do like a ski strap or something underneath, mm -hmm. um, or you could do, um, the same like trucker's hitch with the cord and that goes underneath, um, the ski. Okay. It, still have your binding, but you don't have the pins or something like that, um, then you can set it in there as best you can. And then you, you're going to just try to find bits of the binding that can then go onto the ski. And likely what I would do here is, I don't know if this is going to be long enough or not, but no, nope, I would probably do the cord then. Try and go around the back of the boot. Yeah, exactly. Like try yeah. to get feel. Create your own frame. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and you could even, you could actually do that from the back as well. And to be totally honest, I'd probably do a combination of those. So I'd mm -hmm. like you strap it down and then take the cord and hold it back to the heel piece. Okay. Um, what kind of tape do you use to tape your batteries together in your repair kit? <laughs> Whatever's around medical tape. Um, electrical tape um i don't i don't do enough where it's like a usable piece like i don't like store tape on my batteries okay it's like just enough to cover the battery sure um anything for oh sorry 
Right. Anything for skin repairs? Rips, yeah. broken tail straps? Yeah, ta uh, tail straps. Um, you can also use um, ski straps to swap in those tails, although they don't really stay super well. Um, if you lose a tip, that can be a bummer. Um, so some people do carry spare tips. Um, honestly, if you lose a skin, tail, or toe, you can always ski strap underneath it. Especially tip and tail, it doesn't matter. It's not changing your glide at all. Like if you have a ski strap like just around the tip of your ski, that doesn't really change how well your ski glides in the snow. Same with the tail. Um, in terms of like friction, it really only matters when it's right under your foot. Sure. I've done that. Uh -huh. I mean, like glue fails on skins like all the time and ski straps is the way to go for that. Yeah, the glide kind of sucks, but it gets you out. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> um, what would you do for a broken ski walk mode on a boot? Oh, good question. Um, so there's a bunch of, it, it's a little challenging to say because there's a bunch of different ways boots are made. Um, but sometimes you actually can get access to the walk mode from the inside. And so I would likely um, pull the liner out and then investigate the actual mechanism. And if you own a pair of boots, you might as well look at your mechanism to see how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, but try to lock it in. It depends on what you want. Obviously, if, if you need walk mode, you can't get it into walk mode. That's one thing. But more than likely, you're going to like want ski mode and not be able to get it into ski mode. So for this, it's going to be really hard to show, but it's essentially like a metal peg that slides through a little like um, channel. So I would probably use bailing wire because it's so low profile and try to just affix it in that cool. channel. Um, yeah. I know with like the Scarpa and Atomic, the ones that have like the, the exterior one, if that little pin pulls out, sometimes you can get away with like putting a bobby pin or like a nail through it. Oh yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, super easy fix. My but, other for the Dinafit TLT8 and they have just like a peg goes in the back. Yep, so yeah. Find anything and just shove it in there and then like duct tape it. On. Perfect. Anything just to get you down. Exactly. Um, what else would I have? Um, how many different straps do you carry in total? Uh, I think it's a one, two, three, four, five, six. Cool. Six. And then, and then do straps ever come in handy for snowboarders? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I think that if you have like binding breakage, like if you lose your, that like piece that comes up behind your calf, you can potentially help add some rigidity. Um, if you just lose one of your toe or your like ankle strap, you can use it as that. Um, same skin stuff, you can like keep skins on. You can, yeah, I think it's super useful. Um. A couple last questions before I know you have to jump off for, an, jump off for another call. Is there yeah. any data on relative frequency of different repairs or damage or like how often you should be like checking certain things for repair? Um, the thing that I would check frequently would be, I usually check the screws in my skis every once in a while. I should probably do it more, but probably every couple of weeks if you're a heavy skier, because um, those could potentially get loose. Um, and probably boot parts too. Much. Yeah, Just boot parts like too. Yeah, for loop. wear and stuff. Yeah, we get yeah, people come in all the time. Yeah, and then just like functionality, like you know, you can check see if things are wiggling and stuff like that. For sure. Cool. Well, I think we only have one more pressing question today, and that's how was the snow or snow at and above the Palmer today? Oh my gosh, it was shockingly good. Yeah. Um, so I, I, know, I know you linked my Instagram and this is going to sound like a total plug, but I posted a little like set of pictures. There was a huge avalanche in the White River drainage today, or it was like probably Wednesday night into Thursday. Oh, um, it was like D4. And then it was a dry slab, probably a wind slab. And then it triggered a wet slab that ran 
thousands of feet down the way. So like, I just went up to like get some exercise and then I saw it and I was like, well, that's my new goal. So I got up kind of close. I got a couple of good pictures of the crown. And then there were like probably seven or eight glide cracks, like on different slopes. So like, not only did you see the crown, but I also got to see all these other little cracks. Um, And then the snow skied like corn. I mean, it was April today, essentially. Um, (laughs) Oh, wow. So like skiing was shockingly good. Um, Awesome. So anyway, all all told, it was a pretty cool day. Cool. Pretty good skiing. Yeah, that's awesome. That's crazy. Well, that is, yeah, for sure. It's January, right? What year? It's 2021. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank, thank you so much for joining us, John. Um, I will. It's the nom- nomadic habitat. Yep. Nomadic habitat. Cool. Nice. Um, yeah, I get that in the chat there. And then, yeah, I'll follow up the presentation to everyone once we get the video uploaded and everything. So everyone can refer back cool. to it. I'll include a link or a list of all of the gear that you listed and what other people listed. Um, and yeah, just a link to your Instagram. So if anyone has more questions, you can hit John up on the Instagram. Sweet. Cool. Yeah. Your messages or questions and stuff. Awesome. Thanks again so much. This has been awesome. And thank you everyone for participating. It's been a great whirlwind presentation. I know. Yeah. Sorry. I talked so fast. I wanted to get it all in. No, it's fine. Totally fine. Efficient. Cool. And thank you, Liz. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I was just trying to scare the rat out of my garage. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, thanks, Liz, for putting it on the mount shop, for putting it all on. Absolutely. Everybody. Absolutely. We're stoked to do stuff like this and hopefully eventually back in person. But for now, this, this is awesome <laughs> to get the information oh. out there. So cool. <laughs> all right. Well, with that, we'll call it a night and Yeah, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, everybody.